This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena, straight out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And folks, here we are on May 28th, 2023. And you know what, folks? We have we are going to be talking a lot about, because uh, I'm a big Howard Stern fan. And, uh, of course, uh, I love the movie Private parts which i have here on blu-ray it's just blending into my background here and uh, i know back some years ago at the silverway film festival i met the producer joe medject at that event and uh i'm about to interview my third guest from the film uh, i've had um amber smith has been on here and I've had uh, Richard Park Park now. You know what? I'm going to screw his name up if I don't uh, get Richard's dad or Howard's dad on here because uh, I'm going to screw that up and he's going to call me an idiot. Yeah, Richard Park now. Yeah, play Ben Stern. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Folks, I give you the absolutely lovely, the absolutely beautiful, and the absolutely Britney child from the movie, Melanie Good. How do you do, Melanie? Hey, hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've heard great things about you from Tommy Kovac. You know, I know you were on his uh, podcast uh, more than once. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I like the last time I flipped the script and I was the interviewer. That was great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, you know, um, before we get into uh, uh, private parts, I know uh, you're doing what my brother did uh, with our folks uh, not too, too long ago. And you're caregiving. Uh, we just lost back in April 2022. Uh, uh, we lost our father to ALS after eight years battling it. And uh, my brother took care of uh, my younger brother took care of him and mom is dealing with uh parkinson's and a little bit of alzheimer's yeah. herself and so uh yeah. we got yeah uh, my younger brother and yourself because i worked through the through the uh the whole mess that happened the last few years and uh but my brother's the one who took care of the folks and uh so that's great got a little bit in common with him don't you <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't deal with the Parkinson's. Uh, that's hard. And the ALS, that's hard. Uh, just I have my dad has paralyzing anxiety and my mom has dementia. But, you know, it it could be worse. It could be worse. See, could what's be paralyzing anxiety? I never heard of that. It's the craziest thing. You know, if I hadn't seen it in real life, if I hadn't shown up and actually saw my dad when my mom wound up my mom broke her femur and wound up in a facility in 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I, when I got here, when I landed in Salt Lake, um, my dad was shaking. His hands were always in fists. Uh, his eyes would be closed. And when you'd say, dad, do you want to go lay down? It'd just be, I don't know. Or he couldn't talk at all. And when people would come over, because it was it was troubling. It was it was crazy. There was no communication. It was just a mass panic of anxiety. And he 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 suffers from anxiety, but it took it to a new level. And the neighbors would come over. They're they're very religious, and um, they come over to try to help. And I'm telling you, if I saw it in a movie, I'd say that is massive overacting. But in real life. You you just feel so bad for the person. Like you can see them just suffering. Just he couldn't open his eyes. Like it looked like tears just wanted to come out all the time. We'd go to the doctor, and he'd do the same thing at the doctor. Like he couldn't think. His brain couldn't think. He just couldn't get past the actual anxiety. And it, and it, it never stops. Like it's morning to night, morning to night, all the time. It, it's a real thing. It sounds like, um, oh, not quite so severe with me, but I'm dealing with anxiety thinking about um, the um, possible move to Toronto for a job. Right. So, you know, yeah. um, that's stressful. Moving cities, moving states, it's a lot. Your whole world because it's thrown in the air and you just don't know where you're going to land. You don't feel safe. 
you don't feel like there's any security or sure footing. I totally get it. Yep. Totally get it. But um, I would like to, before we jump into uh, Howard Stern's uh, Private Parts movie, I want to get a bit of your background and what led you to get into the industry. Well, um, I didn't mean to. I grew up in Rochester, New York, which was the home of Kodak when it was thriving. And I just accidentally started modeling because there's a lot of photographers there, obviously. And um, I just started doing shoots and didn't really think that much about it. Then um, I moved to Salt Lake and I started working at a restaurant called Lakai, which was amazing. And um, the, the valet there was a model and a guy, Jim Morrison was his name. And he said, uh, my friend, Larry Bartholomew is a photographer. You should test shoot with them. Like I'd been in, I been in Salt Lake maybe a week at that time. Anyways, so uh, I test shoot with Larry Bartholomew. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't even put makeup on. I mean, nothing. I had lip gloss and a bathing suit. And we shot, we went to the Great Salt Lake. And I'd only done Kodak shoots, like as a little kid, you know, like as a child and like little yellow outfits and flowers and, you know, girly kid stuff. But this was like, you know, he seemed real pro. Next thing I know, that particular shot, the best shot from it wound up on the cover of the University of Utah College calendar. And then it was also purchased by Body Glove. So I was on the cover of two calendars with the same picture. And then it just started rolling from there. I just, I became the blue boutique girl and which is kind of like Fredericks of Hollywood, but the local. And so then my, I was working for ZCMI and next thing you know, I'm, I'm modeling. And then, but I didn't really think anything of it. It was just like, well, I don't know. They, I'm booked on this thing. I, I guess I'm gonna do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I never thought about it. It was never like a decision. It was just like, say yes, see what happens. And then, um, they started shooting a lot of movies and I auditioned for China O'Brien, which I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I got the part. Don't know how, <laughs> just cause I didn't know what I, I show up and, and I really, I had to turn on a light switch when I walk into the room, mm -hmm. not the biggest deal in the world. Right. But you're on a set. It's all make believe. And I'm not actually turning on a light and see in my head, never taking an acting class. I didn't know what you're talking about. And the director kept saying, just hit the light switch because I do like the good scene and then at the end I'd have to switch the lights so that was my introduction to it and then I I became a DJ here in Salt Lake and started doing the public appearances and I got hired by K-Bear but K-Bear wanted me to go to Chicago and I just being from Rochester I'm trying to head warm I wanted to be in California. I don't know why. I, I'd never even really been to California. I just knew I want to go to California. Wind up driving constantly from Salt Lake to San Francisco, LA. So didn't know anybody. Had Didn't know a single person. Next thing you know, I just got in the car, drove to Los Angeles. I had this girl who I was going to roommate with for temporary. And then I still couldn't decide if San Francisco, LA. But then I got a job in San Francisco on Lollapalooza and wound up being the lead dancer with Jane's Addiction. I, I replaced the other two, me and another girl replaced the two girls that were on it. I had gotten a modeling agency in Los Angeles only because a lady had stopped me and said, who are you signed to? I didn't know what that meant. And next thing you know, I'm signed to Wilhelmina. But I was like, well, wait, I just got this job uh, with Jane's Addiction and I really want to see Lollapalooza. I couldn't afford Lollapalooza. I couldn't afford a ticket for Lollapalooza. And suddenly next thing you know, I'm on it as a dancer and it was insane. So when I came back, um, my agency was, I guess, impressed. I I'm just going with it. It was like a wave. I'm just, <laughs> whatever keeps coming. I'm like, okay, I'll take it, I'll take it. When I got back, I started booking music videos and then I got some commercials and then I had an audition as an actor for Seinfeld and I got it. And this was back when you couldn't even pronounce his name. Nobody they kept saying Seinfeld. I don't know what the Seinfeld, I don't know, but go to the audition, got that. And it just, the ball just kept rolling. I never thought about it is what I'm saying. I didn't put any effort into it. 
having said that, um, I took it very seriously. You know, I show up on time. I'm never late. If I'm late, you can worry. Always on time. I uh, have had my shit together. <laughs> you know, like if they told me to bring something or look a certain way or come with rollers, I did whatever they wanted me to do just because that natural people pleaser, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you got Charlie Brown mug. I had... I uh <laughs> I had the the uh, the person that voiced Charlie Brown, the person that voiced uh, Lucy from uh, Race from Your for Your Life, Charlie Brown, on the show here. No way! Yeah, that's awesome. Yep, it, yep, that was pretty. That was pretty uh, incredible, you know. So uh, <laughs> they're they're posting a lot of. Um, uh, a lot of stuff on cons, but they do a lot of work together. So uh, it was pretty c- cool to have them on here, but I know you got them on your mug. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have something fun in the morning, you know, something cute mm-hmm. to look at. <laughs> oh, I got my cat who's over there not looking at anything, just curled up on the oh, bed being lazy. That's good. Lazy yeah. cats or happy cats. Yeah. If I if I do this move, I don't know if he's going to be too happy, but hey, he's going to come with me. Yeah, he'll be with you. He'll be fine. Mm. Don't leave the kitties behind. Never, <laughs> never. Well, the, t- uh, the, the press junket says, never before has a man done so much with so little. Howard Stern, private parts. Now, I yeah. saw this in the theater in 1997 when it came yeah. out, and it actually beat out Jungle to Jungle that weekend, you know, which, which <laughs> you know, despite Tim Allen's uh, uh, popularity and, and not knocking him, but Jungle to Jungle was not a good movie, whereas Private Parts was fantastic. And... Uh, like I said, you're my third guest from the movie, and you, of course, play Brittany Fairchild, <laughs> and you end up in a bathtub with uh, Howard Stern and Fred Norris, who just doesn't take the hint. <laughs> the, other, the other side of yeah. you. How talk about getting um, the part in uh, private parts? You know, there was another one of those things where, okay, at the time, uh, a director named John Landis. I had done a bunch of things for him and it was really cool. It got to the point where he would just cast me on things and my agents would be like, Hey, you got this movie. How'd you get it? It was so awesome. And uh, so I guess he had recommended me. They had told me they saw thousands of girls in New York, then Chicago and then LA. And John had called Betty Thomas, who was the director. I found all this from out from Betty. And so they called him and said, can you recommend someone for this part? We just can't find the right girl. And I had a good friend, Julie Strain, she'd auditioned for it. And she's like, I can't believe I didn't get it. But she had said later too, she goes, have you auditioned for it? Like, no, I hadn't auditioned for it. So I went in at this point, knowing that Julie had auditioned for it, I thought for sure she was gonna get it. But um, so I went in, I wasn't taking it very seriously, meaning like I'm, I wasn't worried. I wasn't stressed. I was like, I'm not going to get this. <laughs> They're going to cast Julie and they've already seen thousands of girls. They're not going to cast me. So I just did it. I was chill. I was relaxed. And my only audition that makes it this unusual was mine was on video only. They never met me. They never saw me in person. They just mm-hmm. cast me on John Landis's um <clears throat> on his recommendation and Betty Thomas later told me we had this funny incident in the bathroom when we were shooting private parts and she said do you know what John Landis said about you I'm like what <laughs> he said Melanie's awesome she shows up she knows her lines hits her marks and then she leaves I'm like, <laughs> like <laughs> does everybody not just leave no people hang out they won't go away I'm like but I have things to do. (laughs) What else am I doing here? Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty funny. That's the first time I ever heard that. He did tell me that later that he like, that's why I cast you all the time. I don't have to worry. And you're not going to bother me. It's as simple as that. I wasn't familiar with uh, your work with John Landis. Now, what what have you done with him? Mm, I did Dream On, which is what I auditioned for Mm -hmm. at first. And I didn't know who he was. You cannot 
imagine how unbelievably green that I was. I mean, I really didn't even understand what a um, director or producer did. I'm just doing what they tell me, like too much of a people pleaser. Yeah, so I mean, John, he had like the Blues Brothers, Animal House, and American Werewolf in London. You know, you name it. Okay, so yeah, so you just brought up Amer you just brought up American Werewolf in London. So I had passed the first audition, and then you go in. You know, you're like they're going to pick from the last girls that they're looking at. I walk into this office and I see American Werewolf on London in London um, poster on the wall. I'm like, but I don't say anything. I was just like, I, I, it's my, well, at that time, it was one of my very favorite movies. I love that movie. And I'd met the guy who was in it. The, he, he remember he was the Dr. Pepper guy. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so, so silly. I think he was hitting on me. I'm not sure, but, but I was so dark. I was like, you're the Dr. Pepper guy. Can I get your autograph? <laughs> and he sends me like a picture signed. Okay. Anyway, so I am, uh, I see, I see the American werewolf. I do the audition and right before I, I'm getting up to leave, I go, by the way, I love your poster. That's my favorite movie. And he goes, wait, 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 what do you mean? I, I, I love American werewolf in London. He goes, that's my movie. I directed it. I'm like, what? No way. I didn't know what directing it meant. Can't understand how dumb I was. Please, please make that a note. I did not understand. But he just starts talking to me about it. And then he starts talking about a bunch of other things. And he goes, you don't know who I am, do you? And I honestly didn't even know the name of the person who is right in front of me. I, I just thought he's a casting person, right? And he just laughed and he said, this is really refreshing. Okay, I'll see you on set. And it just rolled from there. So I did a pilot for him called Campus Cops which was really funny. I, I play like a con girl and Swedish accent. Oh, Yamada. And um, I did a bunch of commercials. He, whenever he would do a commercial, he'd always just bring me on. Sometimes I'd get bumped up. Sometimes I'd just be an extra. But, and there was a couple other things, but yeah, we just had a great working relationship together. I, 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 miss, I miss him being around because I, I'd work, <laughs> I'd work more. But his son, I guess, is a big director now. Yes, he is. Absolutely. And of course, um, uh, Betty Thomas, of course, this yeah. this Private Parts was a good play, would play a good double billing with The Late Shift, which she just got done doing. Oh, The Late know. Shift was great. Yeah. Great book. Phenomenal movie. Yeah. So, I mean, then she does Private Parts. I mean... You know, and it's funny. Before that, she did the Brady Bunch movie. Yeah, it was the Brady Bunch Howard Stern, which is uh, hysterical. But um, but uh, Betty Thomas was perfect uh, director for this after the Late Shift, especially. You know. Yes. So um, I agree. Yeah. So um, talk about working with Betty Thomas as a filmmaker. Oh man. Okay. She is chill just a relaxed person to work with um you didn't feel at all stressed you just felt like she's got my back like she'd be more concerned about me and I was like I'm fine don't worry about me I got this <laughs> she's like are you okay is 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 Howard making you feel uncomfortable <laughs> I mean she was really really cute about it mm -hmm. she did do some unique things which I know that other directors do but you know I'd never met Howard Stern. I, I wasn't a Howard Stern fan when I was hired. I was a little bit scared because once I got hired, my then husband, Mark, had been a huge fan. He's like, oh, you got to listen to the shows. So then I listened to a couple of his shows and that, then I was terrified. I was like, holy shit, I got to lose weight, work out. I just started freaking out. I just didn't, you know, the pressure. I felt the pressure. But then I just stopped listening. I thought, look, I I can only be me, so I better just focus on being me. Um, so Betty, Betty did this thing with, with me and Howard, which she made us hang out together. So, you know, I don't know, you probably heard we shot 12 hours straight. It would be, that's it, 12 hours, no breaks, no in-between, because Howard had to do a show still. Mm -hmm. So he'd do a show, then come on the set in 12 hours. And... 
that's not much time to get to interact. Like it'd be good if it'd be better if it was shot over like, uh, like if my scenes were over like a couple of weeks or something and we could talk or get to know each other because Howard's very shy. And, okay. and she was really concerned that he wasn't going to be comfortable in the bathtub. <laughs> And so we started hanging out. Uh, they put us in a, a dressing room. His, his, his dressing room wasn't like a dressing room. He had like a huge, like, it was basically an apartment. So we, she'd make us have lunch together. But lunch wasn't lunch. It was just snacks. And where I got my legs under me is being a big animal person and a former vegetarian for 11 years. He was eating these giant shrimp and just going, and throwing them down. And and. Throw. and I was aware that he's Howard Stern, but I was also aware that he wasn't eating all those shrimp and those shrimp were living creatures and now they're dead. And the least you can do is eat them. And I said that to him, I said, you know, <laughs> you have to eat the whole shrimp. They died for you. And I'm like, You're right. I never thought of that. And he went back and he ate the whole rest of the shrimp that he had thrown down. And then he was conscientious of eating the whole shrimp from then on. And that kind of broke the ice because it kind of gave me like a, okay, I can be this ballsy girl that's supposed to push him around. And Betty, awesome. Betty, Betty also was super cute about, um, she was really worried about it. Okay, there's another story. I was in the bathroom stall because I have panic pee problems. And, you know, we were about to shoot and I'm nervous. She went into the stall next to me and reached under and tickled my ankle. And she says, don't be nervous. You're going to be okay. <laughs> it was really cute. That was definitely a first for me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I thought that scene was so funny. Of course, you play Britney's child, uh, adult film star. Yeah. And I, huh? No, Britney Fairchild was a B movie star. She wasn't a, she wasn't a porn oh, star. Oh, did I get, did I get the wrong name? Yeah, you said something else, but it's Brittany Fairchild was the character's name. Okay. No big deal. You said it right before. Oh, did I? Okay. Yeah. I, maybe I, I thought, okay. But anyway, I thought it was so funny. You're trying your best to get Howard Stern into that, that bathtub. And, and Fred Norris just seems so game. And then he <laughs> shows up in his boxers and like he's sitting to the back of you and uh, Howard's in front of you and Howard's all nervous and this and that. I just love it when Howard gets up to, to leave and <laughs> Fred just can't take the hand, you know. I, and, and Fred's got that hat, that hat on, you know. It's uh, yeah. I, 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 I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> Talk about working with Howard and Fred in that scene, because that scene was comic gold. <clears throat> it was really fun. So Howard was sitting behind me, and because that was the whole joke of it, it just get behind me and rub my shoulders. And then that's, that's right. I, I, I that's right. I got that backwards, didn't I? Yeah, that's all right. And okay. then Fred was in front of me. The awkward part was we are all. I'm nearly six feet tall. Howard's what six seven, and Fred's a big guy. He's got to be six two, six three. So all three of us are in this small bathtub that's awkward it's awkward there's a lot of legs there's but uh it was three days in a bathtub with like, it, three days of long long hours pruny fingers and um I guess there's a lot of little instances but Howard was nervous so I am glad that we got to know each other before Betty did the right thing he was incredibly conscientious about having the diaper like underwear on so when he get out of the bathtub every time like his underwear would just be dripping all this water and it looked like there was a poop in his pants and it really was just <laughs> he was so mortified shooting that but it was fun <laughs> it was really fun and then like I, I have to run my hands down because you know there's all this bubble bubbles and yeah I can't see underneath the bubbles and I'm trying to this whole thing just and you're trying to make sure you hit the marks right and hit the light right. And my hands keep going down and I, I don't know underneath there. So a couple of times, a couple of times, I touch things I shouldn't have. And he was so like, oh no, like <laughs> he was so uncomfortable. He's like, oh. 
<laughs> it's like I'm just, I'm acting here. I'm like I'm not actually feeling anything. I'm just it's just that could be your knee. I have no idea. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, he talks about stuff like that on the show all the time, you know, but um but I also know you because he is a big animal lover and um I know at the time he was uh married to somebody else, but yeah. I should bring it out here because he did a uh, uh if i can find it for north shore animal league yeah. yeah yeah he did a calendar with his uh oh i found it his current wife yeah yeah beth yeah yeah i got the calendar here and there's of course howard with uh a dog yeah howard's a terrific photographer too and uh something that a lot of people do not know about him so uh Anyway, uh, he's a guy of many hats, but yeah. Um, but yeah. So uh, when you get that shoot done, of course, um, you get the scene, of course, where you're at the movie <laughs> premiere right. with them as 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 well. So um, did you go to the actual premiere for Private Parts? I did. I did. What's that like? It was fun. I mean, it could have been better, but it was really fun. It was my first premiere of anything that I'd been in, and. It was my first premiere ever, so I, I didn't know that it was going to take so long. I didn't eat enough food, <laughs> but it was really fun. I met uh, Rebecca Romaine there, and at the time I was a vegetarian. So Rebecca Romaine and John Stamos were mm -hmm. there, and they sat next to us. So I was with my husband Mark at the time, and. I, he hit it off great with John Stamos and I hit it off great with Rebecca Romaine. She wasn't super famous yet. She was just starting out. And so I had the best time hanging out with her and listening to her tips about how she got that killer body. And, um, you know, I just met so many people and it was my first time. So I wasn't cool. I wasn't chill. I was dorky, dorky me. There's nothing I could do about it. Here's a question I have. You mentioned your husband, Mark. Now, um, yeah. Here, here's a question I have, and it's always been a curiosity for me when people are married to people in the industry. You know, um, what 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 did he think about your bathtub scene with Howard Stern? Oh, he loved it. He thought it was oh, great. Did he? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He was super excited. Like from the moment I got the part, it was like he got the part. You know, I was just like, I gotta memorize my line make sure I'm in shape and then keep working on other things he was like I can't wait till you shoot it I can't wait <laughs> and now he was really excited you see he was very I, supportive you see where some people would would get um jealous seeing their partner do uh sexualized scenes like that there's a lot of course he was a big howard stern fan but the same token you know it's actually kind of cool i i don't have experience in this but seeing your partner on screen doing this stuff you know and uh yeah, yeah it's i i don't know whether it's just a heightened sense of uh uh joy or what you know so uh Anyway, um, it's important to have a partner who is supportive and mm -hmm. isn't jealous like that. I, I've had two husbands and both were very supportive, you know, didn't. Here's the reality. When you're shooting these scenes or doing any kind of sexualized things, I know that there's stories that we've heard of where actors get together. I mean, we all know Brad Pitt, Angelina and all this other stuff. But reality is you're just trying to hit your mark get your lines out, stay in it and not be distracted. There's no, for, for me at least, it's just a part. Like there's nothing else there. I, I honestly, it's like I'm out of myself because I really seriously, like you can't even touch or feel because you're thinking so much. For me, you know, you're thinking so much about the light hitting you, saying your lines right. Mm -hmm. anybody who gets real jealous about that needs to look inside themselves because it's not anything to be jealous of then maybe you don't trust your partner and you shouldn't be together that's my okay. thought mm -hmm. no i agree i agree now uh moving on from there it's funny because i was um doing a 
uh, a cleaning job earlier and I was listening to these two guys um, uh, basically uh, roast the movie Jack Frost, the horror film. And of course, you're in <laughs> Jack Frost, Revenge of the Mutant Killers, I, Snowman. I, <laughs> I am. <laughs> and and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, uh, Michael Coons actually directed that. No, he the movie was very charming. I I was the problem in that. I showed Why? up in the morning. I sh okay, so I showed up in the morning and I was fine. And I somehow got the flu by mm -hmm. about noon. And I was so freaking sick for like the, the bikini scene where, where my head blows up, I was so sick, like mm -hmm. throwing up, running to the bathroom, sick. I could have done better is what I'm saying. I apologize. Okay. Well, talk about, uh... you see, I haven't seen this movie, but I, I've seen uh, um, clips from the first scene. Of course, I'm, I always remember that clip of Shannon and Elizabeth being uh more attacked in the bath, bathroom shower by the snow but that was an image i couldn't get out of my head yeah. uh, so talk about uh, it's a funny concept it's a really funny concept that it, well the ice melting yeah it's funny yeah so talk about your uh role in the movie since i haven't seen this particular movie but i, I gotta hear about this well surprise i, I play a model Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and I'm shooting a scene and the creature is in the ice cube and it's so hot and they keep wanting my nipples to be hard. And so they, they give me an ice cube to try to make it hard. Does that really happen? That has never happened to me, but apparently <laughs> this is what was going on in the movie. So I'm doing that. And then and then I chuck the ice cube and the ice cubes, Jack Frost, you know, and he's mad. So he comes back and blows my head off. Oh. <laughs> any uh, uh, um, any memories of doing the uh, effects for that? Yes, that was the best. Um, you, the guys, oh, I wish I knew their names because, man, they are crazy. When you go to those studios mm -hmm. where they make the molds of your head and they do all the monster stuff, mm -hmm. those guys are so crazy, genius, wild, intensely funny and strange. Like, you just want to be around it. And then you're like, how does your head work? How do you work in the normal world? Do you go to the grocery store and see crazy weird? They just think so differently than the average person that they're amazing to hang out with. It is a little scary though, you know, like I have pictures of it with them doing the facing because you have to breathe through straws. It mm -hmm. might be easier now, but back then you had to breathe through straws and it was I love. I wish I could do more of that. I wish I had done more of that stuff. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and and of course you got uh, according to IMDb. Now I did see this film in the theater. Um, incredible role as a showgirl in What Women Want yeah. with Mel Gibson. Yeah, yeah. Most of my stuff was cut out of that. But in there's a, there's an opening scene with showgirls, and mm -hmm. they really they worked us too hard to, to show us as little as they did. I mean, we worked for weeks choreographing stuff and the audition process for that alone was a three day, eight hour day process. And then you see us for like a blip, but I get residuals. So God bless. <laughs> did you meet, did you meet Mel Gibson and Helen? Hunt? I didn't. No, I didn't. No. I thought Not the concept behind yeah I, I i remember seeing that in the theater i thought the concept of it was pretty funny you know so i think so too really funny music movie really funny yeah it was great they worked they put so much money in that movie yeah now another movie i did not see i actually just discovered it on your imdb today but i have to ask you about it because i checked it out uh okay. dick uh, uh dickster <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That movie's funny. Okay. So that's the last movie that I did. I think that mm -hmm. was 2017, something like that. 16, 17, maybe. Two, I don't know, whatever. So that's the last movie that I did that was like me physically on screen, I think. And 
it might be worth your watching. It's pretty funny. I'm pretty angry in it, <laughs> but I play, I, I play a stripper. And what was kind of cool about it is I was 45 years old when I shot it. I mean, it, it's worth a laugh. It's funny. Okay. Well, you play an angry strip, stripper. Do you want to get into why you're an angry stripper in it? Well, I play Dick Dixter's wife. And so you go from where we meet uh -huh. in a strip club. Because, I mean, basically my career is all based on my dancing skill. Uh, and if I, didn't, if I hadn't been a dancer, um, I don't know if I would have even gotten into Hollywood. They wouldn't have let me stay. Because so I play. So I had a dance. So you see me dancing. And mm -hmm. then we meet, and then you kind of go right to our fucked up relationship. And then uh, I'm extremely angry because I want a divorce because he's a loser and mm -hmm. uh, he can't get a job as a director because it's an alcoholic. And I, just, <laughs> I am mad. It, it has go. all the stages, it has all the stages from the relationship. And then yeah. at the end, I, I try to kill him. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so when I say I was mad, I was pretty mad. Kind of like uh, Carrie Fisher trying to kill uh, John Belushi and the Blues Brothers. <laughs> right, right. There you go. <laughs> well, you've done a lot of television. You mentioned Seinfeld. Yeah. Is there any other yeah. television that stands out to you that uh, is memorable? Because a lot of times uh, people do a lot of television. I want to touch on the stuff that was most memorable to you. Well, for me, I loved doing America's Funniest Home Videos, where I played Ninja Baby Mom and Jackalope's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And that's not on my IMDb, and I don't know why. I get residuals from it. And then I also did um, uh, a thing with the host. Anyway, I, I was a guest host one time. The host, my, his name slipped my memory. But um, so I hosted that. But one of the, my favorite shows I shot was The Nanny. Have you ever seen The Nanny? Yeah, I've actually uh, got an autograph of Nicole Tom. Okay, okay. The eldest daughter. Yeah, she's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I shot that right after the earthquake, after the 94 earthquake. Mm -hmm. um so i was off to shoot america's funniest but of course we got shut down because the earthquake hit and so we had to put that off for a few weeks and in that time i got the nanny of which once again surprise i play a showgirl <laughs> a dancer model showgirl um and that was just really fun the unique part about that was I had a chinchilla that broke its leg in the earthquake in a horrible, horrible break. Its leg got stuck in the side of the, the cage, but the other chinchilla ran and its leg was like twisted in a hor horrendous way. Wow. Anyway, so I, I think we shot the nanny three weeks after because my chinchilla's leg was in a, it had been in a cast because they were going to amputate it. Anyway, I show up on the lot and they see my little cage with my chinchilla because its leg has to be soaked for one hour. Wait, 30 minutes every three hours. Mm -hmm. So I was up around the clock soaking my chinchilla's leg. And it's a little baby. So it's like in a cup, I'm just dipping his leg. Well, I show up and like, you can't bring it. And I'm like, no, wait, you don't understand. Okay, see, see, it's a little chinchilla. It has a broken leg. It has this long cast and that I have to take off to soak it. And then I put it back on. And and I see, I have to dip and I'm explaining the the guy's just looking, there's no animals allowed. He went, but if I don't do this, we have to amputate his leg. He says, he finally goes, just go. <laughs> just go. So mm -hmm. I'm, so on the week that I was there on the nanny, every day I'd bring this little chinchilla and I'm soaking him. And it was so cute because the cast would come up to my dressing room and they'd all be real quiet about it. Like, Can I see your chinchilla? <laughs> and like, um, the, the two lead characters are like dipping, like Fran Drescher, like, can I dip him? like holding my chinchilla, dipping the leg. And it was really cute. That's my most memorable thing, just because it was so adorable. I love Fran Drescher's voice. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people find it annoying, not me, you know. F uh, Fran Drescher is a class all her own. <laughs> yeah, she really is. She turns yeah. it up, though, you know. She, she can tone it down or turn it up, but... 
I thought she was kidding when she first talked to me because I didn't know who she was, but she was coming over to meet me and she went, hi, and I laughed like, hi, because I thought she was being funny. And then I realized, oh, that's how she talks. Okay, got it, got it. I'm glad I didn't say anything because <laughs> I was going to say, oh, very funny. <laughs> Do you have any uh, charities that uh, you want to plug and promote on here or a web page? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if most people knew this, but I had my own animal rescue for 10 years. It was called Gorilla Animal Rescue, mm -hmm. which I have since shut down, but I'm going to be opening up a new animal rescue probably in three years. Mm -hmm. uh, just I've got to get my parents under control and all that. Yeah. But I did just put up a new website, melaniegood.com. And I am trying desperately to get this horrible picture off of my when you Google my name, it goes right to Alexandria Lakewood, which mm -hmm. is a name that I used before I was Screen Actors Guild because I didn't want to get in trouble. I wanted to be Screen Actors Guild really bad and I didn't want, anyway, it's all backfired. So help me, help me Google me and go to pictures that you like. So this awful picture where I'm all sweaty, it's like a paparazzi picture and it's not right. <laughs> It's terrible. It's a bad representation of me. So I'm trying to put my own stuff out there. But here's the bonus on MelanieGood.com. You can get autographs. You can join my site. I have beautiful art shots on there. That if you if you go to like the net, if you buy like the the weekly thing or the monthly thing, and I was an art model, which people don't really know, for years. And I was in Playboy and Perfect Ten. So I've got really, really nice things and I'm going to have t-shirts up soon. Are you checking it out right now? Yeah. Like I didn't know that, um, uh, n number one, we got to talk about the playboy thing, but, um, I didn't know you did, uh, art. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I shot with some of the most phenomenal photographers in the world. I mean, not to mention like Scavulo. Oh, I Fallen thought you meant you. like um, like painting or whatnot. No, no I do okay. do that too. I do okay. do that too, but no, art model shots. Okay, art model all right. Shots. Yeah, I, I, did, I did know model. that. Yeah. I did know yeah. that, yeah. Okay. So in three years, you uh, want to get this up and uh, and to uh, no, center... No, uh, no my, huh? my, Melanie Good, my Melanie Good com just launched. Mm -hmm. It just went up. But um, my animal rescue, I, I plan on starting an animal rescue again. In the meantime, uh, there's lots of places that can be helped, but help local and support whatever does spay and neuter. Because if we don't stop the problem, uh, most of these places that do the big benefits, the money is just not going to the right place. I had yeah. to shut down my gorilla animal rescue because I was just pouring all my money into it. And the government kept wanting me to pay stuff. Like, I don't know how to fundraise. I just didn't do it right. I'm actually a hands-on rescuer. And I did everything from paying to have vets go to Baku and teach the vets there how to spay and neuter because they didn't know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if we don't start at the core, we're not going to solve this problem. And housing a bunch of animals when they're just, we're creating millions every month around the world that are just going to be put down live horrible lives, um, suffer. Like I'm trying to stop the suffering before the suffering starts. Yeah. Oh, I get it. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny too. Cause I've heard this problem of, um, people in charities and, and mention whether, uh, money goes to the right place and whatnot and support is hard. You know, I know because, um, uh, I was involved in one for, uh, for uh, suicide and depression, and uh, I kind of slowed it down because it, uh, uh, it just wasn't getting the attention I was hoping it would get, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, mine was a challenge, though. Mine was uh, after Robin Williams had left us. Yes. Uh, one, came, one came out, was inspired by the Ice Bucket Challenge, but it was, a, uh, it was called the Doubtfire Face Challenge, and you took okay. a pie, pie in the face. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. 
And I had a few of my guests do that, you know, which was uh, pretty amazing, you know, and uh, and uh, I would give to one of their charities in uh, return for that. And uh, oh, that's cute. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm not doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Just to know, not doing that. (laughs) That's okay. That's okay. But um, but nonetheless, um, um. there are a lot of people that come on here and do uh, animal charities and whatnot. And of course me owning a kitty who's yeah. still over there sleeping. Yeah, I get it. My cat's a rescue. So. Yeah. I, I, as they, yeah, they make the best pets. I'm a hands-on rescuer. So for me, we were called gorilla animal rescue because it was gorilla as in warfare mm-hmm. because my rescue partner, Mike Lauren, his wife, Jen, um, We were the first ones into New Orleans right after Katrina, and that's kind of where we were born, Mm -hmm. became Gorilla Animal Rescue because the National Guard named us. But I'm going to start again, and I'm just the one who wants to make sure that it happens. Like when somebody tells me, this poor cat, can somebody help it and nobody can trap it? I'm the one that helps trap it, get it. I've done things that have put me in so much peril that, yeah, I actually was going to do um, a reality show about it. And this is years ago, probably 2011, mm-hmm. maybe something like that. But then they wanted too much of my time and they wanted to be involved in the, the too much of my life where I just wanted to do rescue stuff. So I had a goal, but it doesn't always go the way you want. No, no, that that is always the thick of it. Yes, absolutely. But of course, you know, it's funny too because uh sometimes it's not just um pets, you know, like <laughs> so I I was out on a walk the other night and there was a uh, a couple that got close enough to raccoons to feed them, which I I wouldn't oh. recommend, but the raccoons here are getting into the dumpsters and this and that. So Yeah. They don't, uh, well, they run away, but they're. They're hungry. They have nowhere to go. I love raccoons and skunks. You don't even know. I love them so much. They're so freaking cute. They would come to my house all the time because I was trying to capture a cat that was near my house. So I put out food and water. In LA, you know, it can get really, really hot. So sometimes in the night times, it won't cool down to under 100. And water's a problem. We've cut off all of their access to water. You know, there used to be a creek that flowed below my house. It was just a little stream, but they cut it off. Um, They put up so many walls everywhere that the animals can't get to where they need to be. It's, we have really made it hard for animals. So when you see a little skunk or a little raccoon, don't be afraid. They're busy. They're doing their own thing, just like bees. Cause you know, I was a beekeeper. People are afraid of bees Mm -hmm. and they're not going to hurt you. If you don't try to squish them, they're fine. If they're flying around if they're near you help them they'll crawl on your finger and you can just take them outside if they're in or if they're flying near you and I'm not talking I'm talking honeybees so know your bees a honeybee is busy they don't care about you they care about the flower and the nectar and then getting back home so if you and people when they get stung by bees, I'm just doing a little bee information right now. Um, when people get stung by bees, everybody has a reaction. People have varying levels of reactions. Me, I swell up really bad. I mean, it's horrible. I got stung in the nose once and my whole face swelled up. I went to the hospital and they said, it's a good thing you're not allergic because you'd be dead. So all these parents and people who tell their kids you're allergic, no, no, no. Just because you had a reaction doesn't mean you're allergic. Okay. My informant is done. <laughs> now you mentioned on your web page t-shirts and pictures and stuff. Um, yeah. What kind of uh, um, t-shirts for one? Like, um... I only have one right now that uh, it's just one with me holding a guitar over me. It's a really cool picture. I I actually did it years ago, and I have my friends that were in town from San Francisco. My college best friend and his boyfriend came down, and. So his boyfriend, Felix, is wearing my shirt. So if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see that him wearing that shirt. So mm-hmm. I don't have those up yet on my site. 
but I plan on having them up very soon. Okay. They're really cool. They're, they're cool. I did them when I used to go to London a lot and mm-hmm. they would always have these girls on t-shirts in Camden Lock. And I always thought they were really cool. They were always kind of racy and edgy. So I did one. So, and there I'll do go. more. If they sell, I'll do more. And there I got go. so many cool shots. Michael Lohr has been my photographer buddy since early 90s. And we have so many shots that we would love to make photos out of. And make t- I'm sorry, so many shots we'd like to make t-shirts out of the photos. Do you um, ever get to do the conventions? I haven't done the conventions yet, but I'd like to. Could you I just don't with, know how. Because you'd think that with uh, private parts, there might be something for that. I can't see Howard Stern attending one of these because, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, but um, with a movie like this, especially since you have uh, a, a pretty notable role in the movie, I I can't see why you wouldn't be a hit at the autograph conventions. I started doing them in 2017. They're a lot of fun. And I'm, uh, I was invited uh, by one of my guests that year, and I've done uh, uh, two conventions with her since, and I'm set to do a third one with her this fall. And um, they're a lot of fun to do, and uh, uh, Jeep at the Cosplay and whatnot is amazing, you know, but, but I know they highlight certain movies and TV shows and whatnot, and Sometimes I look at some of these movies like, why aren't they highlighting this? You know, right? And, yeah, and, I'd love to if if you know, hook me up. Have somebody call me, tell me what I'm supposed to do, and I'll I'll reach out to whoever I'm supposed to reach out to, or they can get a hold of me. Yeah. I'm yeah. pretty accessible. Well, what what's the most unique thing you've ever been asked to sign? People send me all kinds of cards. I like it when people. I like drawings. People have sent me drawings of me to sign. That's really cool. I like that. Unique? I don't know. Is there anything unique anymore? I mean, I've signed people's butts and <laughs> uh, I've done, you know, I don't really think anything's been too unusual except the artwork stuff. I love that. There you go. There you go. Well, you know what, Melanie, it was wonderful having you come on here today and uh, and talk about private parts and talk about Howard Stern and and um, talk about your career in general on here, you know, and I wish you uh, best of luck with your folks. You know, I I can't I can't speak for what my brother dealt with because I know he dealt with a lot. um, You know, I remember the phone call whenever my dad had passed, you know, but but. after eight years of ALS, you know, I'm kind of glad he's not yeah. suffering anymore, you know? No, it's a blessing. At a certain point, it really is, Greg. It's just such a blessing. Yeah. So um, I don't know where I'm going from here, you know. I'm, I'm at a crossroads right now in my life, but... Um, well, take a deep um, breath. Take a deep breath and just know that it's going to work out as long as you keep putting the effort out. And just know that it's hard when it tar- starts to get hard. Just try to breathe and don't move too fast. There you go. <laughs> well, before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? I would. Sure. Go ahead. Just uh, state your name and uh, uh, state your name and say that you were uh, Brittany Fairchild and uh uh private parts and say you're listening to uh greg gilbert on python's paradise on python's paradise on python's paradise i'm listening and i'm listening to greg gilbert on python's paradise Mm -hmm. okay go for it hi this is melanie good from howard stern's private parts where i played Brittany fairchild in the bathtub and i'm listening to greg gilbert on python's paradise Absolutely, absolutely. Did uh, I say it Brit- right? Python's you paradise. Did. You did. You okay. did. Do you want me you to do did. one more, another take? Go for it. Why not? Okay. Melanie, good on. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let me try again. 
This is Melanie Good, who is in Howard Stern's Private Parts. You might know me from the bathtub. Well, I'm on Greg Gilbert's Python's Paradise. Hope you are too. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Love your hair. You got beautiful hair. Oh, thank you. I was like, I didn't curl one side. <laughs> who cares? <laughs> you look great. You look thank great. You. Oh, there you thank go. You. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. And it was very fun. And definitely, I'm just trying to push my melaniegood.com so I can try to get Alexandria Lakewood gone. Mm -hmm. It's killing me. There you go. Get rid of that. <laughs> and so Melanie Good can do more good. Exactly. There thanks you go. so much, Greg. Thank you so much. God bless you. And uh, I wish your good folks luck well. On your move. Thank you. And good oh. luck on your move. Thank you so much. I'm going to I'm need all the luck. Yeah. Well, I hope to have you back, you know, at, and um, maybe we can uh, uh, discuss further your website when you get that up and and uh, things further going with it. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Check it and out. Melaniegood.com. It's up now. <laughs> and hopefully more film parts as well. Yeah. It'd be nice to do some some more stuff. Yeah. They shoot a lot in Salt Lake. So hopefully I can make that happen. You hold John Landis. Oh, he's retired. I we we email. Yeah, he's he's long retired, but they shoot a lot, you know. Um uh Kevin Costner shoots a lot of stuff here in Utah. There you go. There you yeah, go. Hopefully, hopefully. All, All right. right. Have a good rest of the day. Good luck on your move. Thank bye. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>